V8 muscle cars are always a smash hit down under, now as much as ever. Enter the Chevy Camaro 2SS, which is now easier to buy in Australia than ever before, thanks to HSV. Unlike the Ford Mustang, the Camaro isn't made in America in right-hand drive. Instead, HSV converts the car in Melbourne at its Swish new factory line in a 130-hour process. This is no backyard job. General Motors gave HSV its engineering data and its CAD files, and the company has spent millions creating or outsourcing for 357 new components. The whole car is warrantied too. Of course, this work isn't cheap. As such, the Camaro is a significant 20 grand more than its Ford rival, which matches its V8 power output. However, it's still a heap of muscle car metal for the money. It's cheaper than a BMW M2, for example, and it's about the same as the final run HSV Malou R8 LSA Utes costs before the end of production. That price premium becomes a bit more palatable when you consider that this silhouette has scarcity on its side. The initial allocation is just 550 units for the first year, with more to follow over the next few years. By comparison, Ford sold 9,000 Mustangs last year alone. Now, the black paint doesn't show the car's lines as well as some other colours might, but man, it looks good and menacing in the flesh. I love the muscular bonnet, the big rear haunches, and of course, those quad pipes at the rear. That Chevy Bowtie badge is still a bit of a novelty as well. Now, being an American car, this is a big offering, really big for a two-door coupe. In fact, it's almost as long as a Nissan X-Trail family SUV. Maybe big on the outside, but it's pretty tight on the inside. Oddly so. American cars don't always have the best packaging, and this is an example of that. The sunroof really eats into my headroom, and that C-pillar is absolutely massive. Seeing out of this car is almost impossible. If ever a car needed a 360-degree camera, it's this one. Though on the move, the blind spot monitoring system does help. I do quite like this dash, though. Okay, the downward-facing screen is a little bit strange, but everything is laid out really elegantly in its own way, and I think the quality is even a little better than the Mustangs. More importantly, these big leather seats are super comfortable and supportive, and have heating and ventilation. Everything's super easy to operate as well. Proof that there's still a place for buttons in this touchscreen-dominated world. You've got shortcuts here for your audio and for your ventilation controls as well. Perhaps my favourite feature of this car, which is a bit strange to say, is the way you change the temperature of the aircon system. You just move these lovely knurled instrument surrounds like so. Really cool touch. On the downside, there are a few minor conversion quirks. For instance, HSV understandably hasn't flipped the centre console alignment, meaning your elbows rest in the cup holders. The main things like pedal alignment and wheel adjustment are spot on though. The lack of sat-nav grates, though there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so that sort of makes up for it. There are also a few squeaks coming from the passenger side door trim, though I presume this press car has probably had a pretty hard short life so far. There's not a lot of storage up front. The door pockets are really small, so is that centre console. But you can always throw your stuff on the back seat. Let's be honest, you're not going to be carrying four people, are you? The Chevy 6.2 litre LT1 naturally aspirated donk has a 1200cc bigger displacement than the Mustang. It matches the Ford's 339 kilowatt peak hour output, that's 455 horsepower, and makes more torque, potent 617 newton meters. It's channeled to the rear axle by an 8-speed automatic gearbox with a paddle manual mode. HSV isn't offering the US market 6-speed manual, yet. A 0 to 100 km an hour dash is dispatched in a few tenths more than 4 seconds. It's one quick mother, provided you're not too busy trying to hang the ass out and leave a rubber trail behind you. There's nothing like a v 8 rumble and lumpy idle that shakes the whole car. This really is a cracker of a drivetrain in the old school sense. It sounds properly ferocious in sports mode under heavy throttle, thanks to its bimodal exhaust, and happily revs out to its 6,500 RPM redline. Indeed, it's at its best under a heavy right foot, because peak torque arrives at 4,400 RPM. It's also capable of being pretty docile in daily driving, as you'd expect. You just put it into its touring mode and the exhaust is really dialed back, 
and the gearbox is really smooth. All in all, a pretty effective daily driver. Surprisingly good on fuel as well. Uh, it's got cylinder deactivation, which means that it runs as a four-cylinder engine in low-stress situations. I did the 150k drive out to the city of Bendigo yesterday from Melbourne, and I got a frankly ludicrously good 7.9 litres every 100k average. I mean, even now, I've done 545k's of driving total of all different types and styles, and I'm averaging 11.7, which is not too bad for a 6.2 litre V8. The chunky wheel is nice in the hand and the digital instruments here can be adjusted to show all manner of mechanical data, from tyre pressures all the way through to oil reserves. One thing that's becoming increasingly clear is that the days of American muscle cars that look great but handle like boats really are over. Uh, unless of course we're throwing the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trackhawk into this equation. It's not as scalpel sharp as a BMW M2, sure, but it's a big heavy muscle car, so what do you expect? And you know, it's not quite as floaty and comfortable over really bad corrugations as a locally tuned VF2 Commodore was, but it's pretty good, all told, and that's despite running on hard sidewall run-flat tyres. Despite the fact that HSV had to move the steering wheel from over there to here, there are no gremlins or, or eccentricities with the positioning of the wheel or the way it feels. It's quite resistant and heavy in all of its modes, but I happen to think that suits the car's feel and disposition. And as you cycle through those aforementioned modes, it actually relaxes the stability control and sharpens and changes the throttle mapping, so you get a little bit of rear end play on takeoff, which is really befitting of a rear drive muscle car. It's got independent suspension front and rear. It doesn't have the Magnaride dampers that the US models have as an option yet, unfortunately, just fixed dampers, but all pretty good. It's got Brembo ventilated discs at each corner and they're reassuringly good at pulling this car in, despite the fact that it weighs a hefty 1,700 kilos. And it's even got a limited slip diff. Just like the Mustang, I'm pleasantly surprised by how nimble and capable this is in twisty roads. It's not just a straight line warrior. So that's the first local drive of the Chevrolet Camaro by HSV. The company reckons it sold almost three quarters of its initial allocation and in a lot of ways that's not a huge surprise. Yeah, it's a fair bit more expensive than the Mustang which has the advantage of coming right hand drive from the factory. But it helps fill the massive hole left in the automotive landscape by the GTS and Marlou post local manufacturing. Another way to look at it? Well, you're still not getting anything out of Europe for 86 grand with this kind of power and this kind of presence. What do you think? Head over to caradvice.com to read the more detailed written component of this review and leave us a comment.